Many early peoples were heavily influenced by their beliefs in the supernatural world. Before the ancient Chinese Shang dynasty fell, superstitions and otherworldly forces played an important part in its people's everyday lives. What superstitions do you have? I don't wash my uniform all year. I always knock on wood. When I was little, I used to not step on cracks and sidewalks because I used to think I'd break my mother's back. I don't really have any superstitions in that way. The last year, I had a superstition in math that if I didn't sign my name in cursive on the top, I would not do well on the test. If any of my family members have a dream about fishes or like a river with fish or any type of fish, that means like someone in the family is, is with child or pregnant. I go to bed facing the same direction every night. I do not have any superstitions because I do. Existence is no longer in doubt. The Shang created China's first dynasty, but they destroyed themselves in the process. Their history was carved into animal bones and mysterious symbols. Three thousand years back in time and deep beneath the surface of China lay the birthplace of their kingdom. Called Great City Shang, it's the center of an archaeological manhunt that began a century ago. Today, the search continues. The goal is irresistible, for what they hope to find is the dawning of China itself. In central China, a night watchman approaches a building that holds evidence of an ancient mystery. This resting place, filled with human remains, is a legacy of the mysterious Shang dynasty. Some 3,000 years ago, Hundreds of people were killed and buried here. Ancient writings cast a dark shadow on the Shang. The heart of the last Shang king was evil. The crowds intoxicated themselves, and the rank smell was perceived on high. Therefore, heaven had no mercy for them. While the ancient Egyptians reached the height of their power, the Shang city-state dominated northern China. The Shang waged successful campaigns against many rival tribes, including the Zhou, the Tufang, and the Gongfang. Here in Beijing, the nation's capital, the hustle and bustle of new China is rapidly overtaking the old. China's march into the future could destroy evidence of its first true dynasty before it can be uncovered. were the Shang. 3,000 years ago, they laid siege to northern China in a quest for power. Today, archaeologists are racing against time to find the lost world of the Shang. At the Beijing Institute of Archaeology, they are using new technologies in the search for this elusive dynasty. It's such a high priority that it has become an international effort that includes experts from the United States. Led by Dr. K.C. Chong of Harvard University, the team recorded their early discoveries on home video. Joined by experts from universities in Missouri and Minnesota, they began work in 1992. Early on, they uncovered a Neolithic settlement that dates back to 2000 BC. It contained the remains of sacrificed cattle. Such ritual sacrifices have been linked to the Shang. Whether these are the remains of their ancestors is still a puzzle. 
The most ambitious goal of the Chinese American team is to find the dynasty's first capital, known as Great City Shang. Deeply buried, it's an archaeological needle in a haystack. To look for clues, MIT geophysicist David Sist will help deploy a wide range of high-tech equipment. One of the advantages of the technology right now is being able to use electromagnetics and ground penetrating radar and magnetometry and satellite data to be able to bring to bear all these different things to penetrate the ground more deeply. If you're looking for a very small object in tens of square kilometers, um, the main problem is trying to see things underground that are not, not visible. You wouldn't be able to see just by walking around. Based on ancient historical accounts, the first capital of the Shang is hidden near the present-day city of Shangchu in Henan province. This, is a, this aerial photo is very useful to see the, the current course of the Yellow River running from west to east, and this is the old course. The ancient stronghold they are looking for is buried somewhere within an area of 40 square miles under several feet of sediment. This says that there's, there's two walls around the city. For Dr. Robert Morochik of Harvard University, the discovery of Great City Shang is a crucial link to solving the mysteries that surround China's first dynasty. During the reign of Shang, the city was smothered by silt from a great flood. Centuries later, when the Zhou defeated the Shang, the deposed Shang royalty built a new city called Song above it. Flooding would claim city song as well. As we find the city and excavate the city, we're hoping that we'll be able to find the ancestral temples and maybe ancestral tablets that would help clarify where Shang came from and the genealogy of Shang and how this great Bronze Age civilization in North China developed and laid the foundation for a lot of the features in Chinese civilization that we see. For centuries, the search for Shang has been plagued with doubt. Early scholars dismissed the legends of their kings. Tales of Shang exploits were confined to poetic fantasy and the painter's brush. Then, in 1899, came a clue right out of a detective novel, or so the legend goes. In Peking, a Chinese scholar named Wang Nu Zhang lay deathly ill. Lying beside his sickbed were strange pieces of animal bone. Because the Chinese ascribed magical powers to dragons, they were called dragon bones and were ground up and consumed as traditional medicine. The bones caught the eye of Wang's colleague, Liu Tiang. Liu noticed the fragments were covered with mysterious inscriptions. Wang's illness subsided, and later he and Liu wondered who could have carved these ancient symbols. The two scholars combed Peking's traditional pharmacies to save as many of these remains as possible. They collected thousands of fragments. Following Wang and Liu, a host of scholars devoted their careers to breaking the code on the mysterious dragon bones. Could these be messages from the fabled Shang warriors? Today, at the Institute of History in Beijing, Li Su Qin continues the quest to decode the inscriptions. Over the years, more of the characters were deciphered and a landmark discovery was made. The inscriptions were the earliest form of written Chinese, the roots of the oldest language still in use in the world. 
they predate the first known Chinese writing by 500 years. Many characters appear pictorial. This playful character means boy. This one stands for subdivided agricultural field. And the symbol for leader looks like a man standing beneath a flag. As they decoded more characters, scholars discovered that some were names of Shang rulers. The names match those listed in the ancient texts. The archaeological detectives had hit the jackpot. They also found uniform cracks beside the characters. They were made by boring holes on the opposite side of the bones and using a burning stick to make the crack in the weakened surface. Many of the characters carved beside the cracks were questions posed to the spirit world. Where the crack occurred answered the question. Shang Kings used the bones to predict the future. The dragon bones were now called oracle bones. The Shang demand for them was insatiable. They established special farms and workshops where they processed the tortoise shells and cattle shoulder blades. They sent the oracle bones hundreds of miles to Shang ceremonial centers. Over the course of Shang rule, tens of thousands of hours were consumed by these rituals. Shang kings ruled because people believed they could communicate with the spirit world. Assisted by shaman Mu Ding, the 21st Shang king, posed this question to his ancestors in the spirit world. Will we receive the millet harvest on the fourth moon? These extraordinary ceremonies played a vital role in every major decision of the Shang kings. They asked the oracle bones such things as whether or not they would have a successful millet harvest, whether they would have successful childbirth within the royal family, the outcomes of military in, uh, endeavors against their neighboring tribes, such things as whether they should carry out sacrifices in the names of certain ancestors. According to the records of court scribes, Mu Ding's ceremony reached its climax as the shaman placed fire to bone. The cracks are auspicious. The grain harvest will come in the fourth moon. Investigators reasoned that the only way they could learn more about the Shang was to find out where all the oracle bones were coming from. Medicine shop owners finally admitted the bones were being dug up at a town now called Anyang. Why was this obscure town bursting at the seams with inscribed animal bones? To find out, a series of excavations began in 1928, and it continues to this day. Recently, investigators discovered a Shang cemetery on the outskirts of Anyang. Here, Tang Ji Gen sifts for clues to the average lives of ordinary Shang people. This is a typical burial of an ordinary person of the Shang dynasty. We found these two pieces of pottery. These were used for cooking. Tang Jigen hopes somewhere in this maze of earth lie clues to the fall of the Shang. The discovery of this cemetery is a direct result of the search for the oracle bone stockpile that began here 70 years ago.
Archaeologists had uncovered countless fragments by the 1930s. Unearthed at one site was a solid three-ton mass of inscribed shells. Then, after years of digging, they discovered huge tombs. Although mostly emptied by looters, one of the graves contained giant bronze vessels. The discovery astonished the archaeological world and whetted the appetite of tomb robbers. With the discovery of oracle bones at Anyang, I think it must have had something of a Wild West look to the area. In the 1920s, this part of Hunan was beset with bandits and warlords. Antiquities and treasure hunters descended on the area in order to find the treasures and sell them to the antique shops in Beijing and to foreign buyers. When archaeologists were finally able to move into the area, they had to do so under police and military protection. The excavations came to a sudden end in the late 1930s. The Japanese invaded China. On the heels of the Japanese defeat came a bitter civil war. While China fought for its life, Anyang would have to wait. At Anyang, the quest to learn more about the Shang began again in 1950. Then in 1976 came a discovery that surpassed all others. At the bottom of a deep pit called Tomb Number Five, Archaeologists discovered treasures that had been undisturbed for 3,000 years. The discovery of tomb number five at Anyang might be compared to the discovery of the tomb of King Tutankhamun in Egypt that contained riches beyond archaeological belief. It had been unlooted, and so for the first time, archaeologists had a sense of the richness that the royal tombs of Shang held. Hundreds and hundreds of bronze vessels, as well as large quantities of jades, ivory objects, and other wonderful works of art. This figure gives hints to formal Shang posture and costume. The Shang believed that jade prolonged life. They crushed the stone into powder and consumed it as a magic potion. While their jades were brilliantly fashioned, they were no match for their bronze work. The Shang treasured bronze above gold. Its strength and versatility made it the ideal metal for ritual vessels. Shang kings had no interest in seeing themselves portrayed in bronze. Instead, artisans were given the freedom to explore a world filled with fantastic beasts. They created hundreds of tons of ritual vessels. Investigators concluded they had found the last and most powerful capital of the Shang. Finally, a window on the lost world of the Shang was opened. A palace compound was exposed, and over the original foundations, the buildings were recreated. Anyang housed the royal bureaucracy, a host of bronze artisans, thousands of slaves and peasants, and vast armies. Shang forces attacked their neighbors with great speed. Archaeologists uncovered exciting proof of this in Anyang. Here are chariots so valued, they were buried as sacrifices near the tombs of the kings. How the Shang built them was at first a puzzle. Not a single nail was found. Research has shown that chariots were meticulously assembled with wooden pegs and leather lashing, a marvel of ancient technology. 
18 spoke wheels and wooden axles were coated with animal fat to reduce friction. During the early Shang period, chariots served as mobile command units surrounded by close supporting infantry. Bronze weapons were created for maximum impact. A phalanx of dagger axes cut the approaching enemy to shreds. The identity of one of their fiercest commanders was confirmed at tomb number five. Inscribed on its bronzes was the name Fu Hao. Oracle bone inscriptions tell us about Fu Hao leading armies into successful battle. But the oracle bones also tell us something else. They tell us that Fu Hao gave birth. Fu Hao, it turns out, was a woman and one of the consorts of one of the very powerful Shang kings. Historians believe this phenomenal woman led 13,000 troops against Chung tribes to the west. Fu Hao's cause of death is a mystery. Her demise broke the heart of the king. The fate of Fu Hao's soldiers could have taken a deadly turn far from enemy lines. Found beside the Anyang chariots were the bodies of Shang troops sacrificed with their horses. This was just a hint of a chilling discovery to come. In 1950, 41 bodies were found killed on the ramps of a royal burial chamber. 24 women on the west side, 17 men on the east. South of the royal tombs, a vast cemetery of sacrificial victims shocked the most seasoned archaeologists. In mysterious rites, more than 300 people had been killed in a single day. A few of their graves remain open to scholars. It came as a big surprise when we first excavated these human remains. We thought the royal burials were meant for royal families only. Nearly 1,200 sacrificial pits were found in this area. The bodies are very well organized. They put them in layer by layer, with a dozen bodies inside. When Fu Hao died, Shang tradition dictated an elaborate ritual take place at her tomb. A great pit was dug with ramps and staircases cut from the earth. Her coffin was surrounded by bronze ritual vessels, weapons, and jade treasures. Shang society really has two faces. On the one hand, we have this creative genius that produced wonderful jades, incredibly sophisticated bronze ritual vessels and weapons, uh, very, very sophisticated society. On the other hand, though, Shang society was a very cruel society in which to live. Dogs were killed to guard Fu Hao from the evil spirits of the underworld. The march of death was joined by war prisoners. Then came an extraordinary sight. Faithful servants and trusted bodyguards joined their mistress. The road to the afterlife was paved with the dead.
At the cemetery site in Anyang, over 50% of the pottery is identified as vessels used to drink alcohol. Many contain a high amount of lead, which might have contributed to the decline of the Shang royalty. Another theory of decline involves sacrificial rites and governmental gridlock. When important members of the royal clan died, ceremonies marking their death continued year after year. Shang kings fell hostage to this endless protocol. Meanwhile, the outside world began to close in on their borders. In the end, the ceaseless territorial expansion of the Shang worked against them. Dr. Zhang Chang Shou is co-director of the joint project. The other major reason is that Shang expanded to the east in the later years and fought a lingering war. Many minority groups united and attacked from behind. This defeat was the direct cause of the Shang dynasty's decline. Even the oracle bones began to chronicle the Shang Empire's descent. There will be calamities. The two farm barbarians have attacked our eastern borders and have seized two settlements. The Gong farm barbarians have invaded the fields on our western borders. Around 1,000 years before the birth of Christ, Shang rule collapsed. Anyang, the last Shang capital, gave clues to the dynasty's fall. Finding their first capital could tell scientists how the Shang reign began. On May 2, 1996, the very last day of the digging season, investigators found the remains of an ancient wall. Pottery fragments embedded in the rammed earth indicate the wall is most likely part of the Zhou period city, built on top of Great City Shang. Electronic sensors are used to produce a profile of the wall. At a makeshift computer lab, a cross-section shows that the wall is at least 30 feet high and 50 feet wide at the base. Surveys overlaid on satellite photos show the wall extending two miles in every direction, an effort that involved thousands of workers and years of construction. Archaeologists hope their discovery will help secure the area from development until the exact location of Great City Shang can be found. They hope to first uncover the Zhou City of Song and finally Great City Shang itself. Here, archaeologists may open the first chapters of an epic filled with fantastic kings, mistress warriors, and tragic weakness. It was written that when the last capital fell, the reigning Shang king burned himself alive in his palace rather than surrender. Perhaps this was a fitting end for the Shang, a dynasty of fire, bone, and death. <laughs> Did you know, spaceborne photography has revolutionized archaeology. Satellite sensors can detect variations in soil colors that reveal features no longer visible to the human eye. While flying over the Great Wall of China, NASA radar penetrated the ground and discovered another wall built some 900 years before the one that is visible today. History is filled with tales of conquerors who mercilessly killed their enemies to expand their empires. But when one of India's greatest early leaders saw the carnage his military conquest had caused, 
It changed him, and he turned his back on violence. Have you ever witnessed something that changed your beliefs? It just really opened up my eyes. People starving, like on TV, and kids who never got an education, and people with no families, and homeless. There can be examples of poverty even in our nation's capital, and our nation is the richest country in the world. I used to believe that all people were equal, and then I like look in the newspaper. As a result of seeing on television so many suicide bombings in Israel and other terrorist attacks, have just come to realize that people aren't fundamentally good. There was one person standing in the middle of Tiananmen Square, and they were stopping an entire line of tanks from rolling in, and it kind of makes you realize how one person can make a difference. In the third century BC, the emperor Ashoka used military power to become one of the greatest rulers of ancient India. For nearly 40 years, he ruled the vast Mauryan Empire. Through war and conquest, he brought nearly all of India under a single ruler for the first time. Ashoka made the capital city of Potaliputra, now known as Patna, the nucleus of his empire. Under Ashoka, India prospered, art flourished, and the culture of the Mauryan Empire ushered in the first great flowering of Indian civilization. Ashoka was known as a great military strategist, and his army was extremely well organized. It had a strong chain of command and even detailed written manuals to guide the soldiers. His soldiers were well paid and well trained. They spent much of their time training and preparing for battle. But Ashoka had an even more formidable weapon. His army used elephants to win many victories in battle. With their very large bodies, elephants are able to do things during combat that are too difficult or dangerous for other forces, such as marching in front, destroying ramparts, gates, and towers, trampling the enemy's army, and causing terror. Other Indian armies during this time also used some elephants in combat, but Ashoka had 9,000 of them, and they trained right alongside his soldiers. The infantry, cavalry, chariots, and elephants trained outside the city every day at sunrise, except on days of special astrological significance. Ashoka led his last military campaign against the rich kingdom of Kalinga, located on the Bay of Bengal. Kalinga controlled the country's southern trade routes. This was Ashoka's last remaining competition in India. In 261 BC, Ashoka set out with his army for the assault on Kalinga. A well-planned system of roads crossed the empire and helped soldiers and civilians alike get around. Over the years, Ashoka had lined this primitive highway with ponds and wells. Without them, his traveling armies would have perished within days. A general took the lead, then the emperor himself flanked by his bodyguards. Behind him marched thousands of elephants, horses, oxen, and soldiers. After them came the part-time militia and craftsmen then the companies of allies and mercenaries. Behind them, finally, rolled thousands of wagons and beasts of burden loaded with equipment and food for the enormous army. Engineers and laborers forged ahead, repairing boats and bridges and preparing fords before the army arrived. Sometimes, the elephants formed a living bridge. After marching hundreds of miles, the Mauryan army entered the kingdom of Kalinga. At the front line stood Ashoka's elite, the mounted archers. Each war elephant carried three fighting men, two shot from the side and one from behind. A fourth man guided the animal. Against so many war elephants, the Kalingans were outmatched. 
Some got tossed in the air, others crushed underfoot. The rest panicked and ran. With its army beaten, Kalinga soon surrendered. After the battle, Emperor Ashoka was shocked to see the suffering and carnage he had caused. Ashoka was so full of remorse that he renounced the use of violence and embraced Buddhism. The religion of Buddhism had started in Ashoka's homeland of Magadha, a region in the modern-day states of Bihar and Jharkhand. The Buddha himself used the Magadhi dialect of Sanskrit. Ashoka had boulders and pillars across India inscribed with his pious declarations. He asserted his belief in ahimsa, or non-violence. One of these inscriptions read, The beloved of the gods, Ashoka, conquered Kalinga. 150,000 people were deported, 100,000 killed, and many times that perished. The slaughter, death, and deportation of the people is extremely grievous. The beloved of the gods wishes that all beings should be unharmed, self-controlled, calm in mind, and gentle. Ashoka had numerous Buddhist monasteries built and made Buddhism the state religion. And he sent Buddhist missionaries throughout India and as far away as Syria, Egypt, and Greece. Ashoka also urged tolerance of all faiths, regulated the slaughter of animals, and softened the harsh laws of his predecessors. When he died around 232 BC, his empire collapsed into chaotic fighting between rivals. But Ashoka had led one of India's greatest cultural and religious revolutions. And although in India Buddhism would eventually become only a minor religion, Ashoka's support helped the religion spread and survive in other regions of the world, where it lives on today. You've been given all the information. Now it's your turn to discuss the questions. Take a moment to talk about the following. What caused China's ancient Shang dynasty to fall? How did the experiences of war change India's Emperor Ashoka? If you'd like to learn more about what you've just seen, go online or check out these books at your local library. As you watch the next two segments on the collapse of the Russian Empire, keep these questions in mind. What tensions within Russia led to the revolution of 1905? How did the actions of the Tsar and Tsarina bring down the Russian Empire? The Tsars of Russia created one of the largest empires the world had ever known. But perhaps because their empire was so big, they often ignored the desires of the people they ruled. What can people do when their government ignores them? When the government ignores the people, they're, they're forced to, to act in a way that can grab national attention. The people only have the choice to either revolt or leave the country. Do peaceful protests and um, gatherings to try to get their point across. Riots are a negative thing, but they do get attention. People can always write up petitions, speak to congressmen, but honestly nothing's as effective, effective as physical action. Attempting maybe to get someone in government who's doing the right thing or can speak for a large group of people who want change. In the 1800s, the Russian Empire was ruled by a czar or king. Czars had controlled Russia for several hundred years. Czarist Russia had a rigid social structure. A few privileged people lived lives of luxury, but the majority struggled just to get by. A third of all Russians were serfs, peasants forced to work the land for masters who controlled their lives. Life in Russia had been this way for centuries, but in the 1800s, people were growing increasingly dissatisfied.
Most czars ruled as firm autocrats. They imposed their will on their subjects and showed little concern for people's needs. But sometimes the czars had to make changes. In 1861, under pressure from all sides, Tsar Alexander II freed the serfs. But the action backfired. No longer forced to work the land, many former serfs moved to the city to work in factories. Instead of finding prosperity, they found overcrowding, poverty, and disease. The Tsar's reform hadn't made the people happier. It made them more discontent. When Alexander's son and grandson succeeded to the throne, they abandoned his reforms and returned to the policy of harsh repression. The Tsars became increasingly unpopular, and opposition to the Tsarist regime continued to grow. Then in 1904, war broke out between Russia and Japan. Both nations wanted to gain control of Manchuria and Korea in East Asia. Russia believed it could easily defeat the Japanese. At the same time, the Russian government saw the war as an opportunity to rally support around the Tsar and distract Russians from their dissatisfaction with things at home. But the Russians greatly underestimated Japan's military strength. During the Russo-Japanese War, the Russians suffered defeat after defeat. In 1905, Japan destroyed the entire Russian Baltic fleet. Many people blamed the Tsar, Nicholas II, for the humiliating losses. Newspapers and revolutionary leaflets spread the news of the military disasters and fanned pent-up discontent created by years of oppression. The workers called the general strike protesters flooded the streets, and liberals demanded a constitution. Amid the turmoil on January 22, 1905, a young priest led a large group of workers in a peaceful march to the Winter Palace. Carrying religious icons, they planned to present a petition to the Tsar. But Nicholas II called in his troops. Tsarist soldiers opened fire on the crowd, killing more than a hundred innocent people and wounding several hundred more. This event, known as Bloody Sunday, sparked the Russian Revolution of 1905. For months, Russia was torn by strikes, riots, mutinies, and political assassinations. Nicholas feared that the violence would topple his empire. Toward the end of 1905, he issued the October Manifesto. In this document, he promised basic civil liberties. He also announced the formation of a national legislature, or Duma, that would have to approve all new laws. The first Duma met the following year. It did not take long for delegates to learn that despite promised reforms, Nicholas II was still in charge. After 10 weeks, Nicholas simply dissolved the Duma because the majority of those elected had opposed him. Nicholas had survived the revolution of 1905, but the people's anger didn't disappear. And in just a few short years, the people would rise again. And the Tsar's regime and his empire would come crashing down. Did you know? In 1932, the Hollywood studio MGM released Rasputin and the Empress, a film that portrayed a love affair within a fictional Russian royal family. But the princess in the film was based on real-life Russian princess Irina Romanov Yusupov, who filed a lawsuit against MGM, claiming libel. Because she won her suit, all Hollywood films now include a disclaimer. Tsar Nicholas II of Russia managed to maintain control in Russia following the revolution of 1905. But the actions he took following the revolution eventually led to another one. And this time, the revolution would bring down his empire. 
How do revolutions change things? Revolutions make people think in a new way. They get rid of old power, they put in new ones, new forms of government. They give people freedoms. Well, if it's successful, then it's changed for the better. Unsuccessful uh, revolution, nothing really happens. The people who are protesting just get punished. Well, revolution's necessary for any sort of political change to happen. In the short term, revolutions can overthrow the government and the people, the dissenting people, can change the government so it sort of supports what they do. It's just a cycle in history that a regime usually becomes more oppressive and then a revolution has to occur for it to become more free. In the long term, the difficulty of this is the people need to maintain their government. People's war in a lot of circumstances is needed and justified um, in order to replace illegitimate regimes and illegitimate authority. In 1913, Tsar Nicholas II and his wife Alexandra celebrated the 300th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty. For three long centuries, Tsars from the Romanov family had ruled Russia. Rebellions against the injustices of the Tsarist regime broke out now and then, but they had always been crushed. After the failure of the revolution of 1905, Life in Russia seemed to return to normal. But an international crisis was about to fan the flames of discontent once again. When World War I erupted, Tsar Nicholas sent his armies into battle against Germany. Russia had the second largest army in Europe but it was one of the least industrialized countries in the war. Its military relied on sheer numbers against its more advanced German enemy. As a result, Russian casualties mounted quickly. Rumors of military incompetence spread and soon turned the Russian people against the war. To help bolster morale, Nicholas decided to go to the front lines and take control of the army himself. While he was away, Tsarina Alexandra was left in charge of the country. But many didn't trust Alexandra because she had been a German princess before marrying Nicholas. This led to a string of resignations among the Tsar's ministers. The Tsarina put her trust in a man whose name would come to haunt the Tsar, Grigory Rasputin. Rasputin was a semi-literate peasant and a self-professed holy man. He was well known for his religious fervor and earthly indulgences. But Rasputin had won Alexandra over with his charisma and his ability to help her son. Alexis, the Tsar's only son, had hemophilia, a genetic blood disorder. Rasputin seemed to be the only person who could alleviate the boy's suffering. Rasputin gained a strong influence over the royal family. Alexandra, who came to see Rasputin as important to the safety of her son, was completely captivated by him. When the Tsar went to the front lines to supervise the troops, Rasputin transformed his influence over Alexis and Alexandra into political power. Officials who criticized his growing power were removed from their posts. The Tsarina replaced them with Rasputin's friends or others whom he could control. Rasputin's behavior and scandals involving the officials he recommended undermined the Tsar's authority. Making matters worse, back on the front lines, Nicholas was having no better luck than the generals he had replaced. The Tsar's popularity plummeted as Russian casualties mounted. Food became scarce and inflation increased the suffering on the home front. Seeing that the empire was in trouble again, a group of wealthy Russian nobles in St. Petersburg, including the Tsar's cousin, decided that the Tsar's authority must be returned. Getting rid of Rasputin was the first step. In December 1916, they plotted to assassinate Rasputin and end the shame he was heaping on the monarchy. 
when a generous portion of poison failed to kill him. Rasputin was shot. And his body was thrown into the frozen Neva River. But it was too late. Rasputin's incompetent political appointees had helped convince the Russian people that the Tsar's government was hopeless. And as the Tsar's ongoing war with Germany made Russia's failures mount and its food dwindle, the government was rocked to its very foundations. Finally, Nicholas was forced to abdicate in 1917. He became a prisoner, first in his own palace, then in Siberia. Russia erupted into revolution and civil war. Revolutionary Bolsheviks seized power and battled against the forces still loyal to the Tsar. The Bolsheviks feared that the Tsar might one day return to power. So on the night of July 16, 1918, they executed the Tsar and his family. By late 1920, the fighting was over. Vladimir Lenin and his Bolsheviks, now known as communists, were busy turning the Russian Empire into the Soviet Union. And the Romanov dynasty that had ruled Russia for more than 300 years was gone. You've been given all the information. Now it's your turn to discuss the questions. Take a moment to talk about the following. What tensions within Russia led to the revolution of 1905? How did the actions of the Tsar and Tsarina bring down the Russian Empire? We hope you've enjoyed this assignment discovery journey into the lost empires of Asia and Russia. If you'd like to learn more about what you've just seen, go online or check out these books at your local library. That's a wrap for today, but tune in next time as America goes to war with itself. We'll revisit two of the most important battles ever fought on U.S. soil. We'll witness the turning point in the Civil War at the Battle of Gettysburg and explore.